Hello, I'm Ann Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers. Before she turned to writing fiction, Talia Carner worked for Red Book Magazine and was the publisher of Savvy Woman Magazine. She is a committed supporter of human rights, particularly the plight of women and children around the world. And this is evidenced in what she writes. She is an activist not only through the written word, but indeed. It is my pleasure to welcome Talia Carner. Thank you very much for having me. You have written four books. The new book, Hotel Moscow, is your fourth book. We're going to try and, and get to the others a little later, but I want to start with this one. Wow. How long did it take to write, and what was the inspiration? The, it, it, I wrote this book in two stages. Once I started, it was actually my virgin maiden writing of any novel, any fiction, I began to write on November 3rd, 1993 at 2.48 p.m. <laughs> that was... <laughs> now that's specific. Three weeks after I escaped from Russia and uh, my uh, report to the USIA, US Information Agency that had sent me to teach business skills to Russian women uh, turned into a novel. So that's how I started. That novel, which featured the Russian women's lives, never got published. And then, fast forward a couple of decades later, I was working on another novel with the protagonist being an American liberal New Yorker businesswoman who was Holocaust out, as you were probably hearing about the Holocaust. And she didn't believe in, she wanted a different, different approach mm -hmm. to life. She happens to be going to, so, okay. So then I wanted to say, okay, let's take this liberal view and put it smack against anti-Semitism. Let's see what happens then. And that's when I realized that actually I had the background, all the research had been done. And I thought that if I just took her and put her against that, it would take me six months. I was on book tour for Jerusalem Maiden. And within six months, I'll put something in the pipeline with my publisher before I go on to write my next book. Well, it took me three years. Nothing is simple in writing. As I, the more I developed her, the more there was to her. There are a lot of layers, a lot of layers. And I want to take a step back for a moment and, and it, briefly, this is an American woman. She travels to Moscow on a mission to teach entrepreneurial skills to Russian women. It is 1993, just after the fall of communism, and there happens to be an uprising with the, the Russian parliament, I believe, against the, the then president, mm -hmm. Boris Yeltsin. Now, Moscow is not the place you want to be at this particular time. And yet, in real life, that's where you were. Yes, I happened to, that was my second trip to Russia. I went in May 1993, and then again in October. And I landed in Moscow two hours after the uprising against Boris Yeltsin broke. Were you, were, had been told there is a risk to uh, going now? The State Department had not issued an alert because it seemed to be a very contained conflict. It, was, it seemed to be mostly political, even though yeah, by that time Yeltsin had put tanks all around the parliament in the middle of downtown Me uh, Moscow. But that was going on for two weeks, and our programs, the programs that I was supposed to be involved, were all over town, a lot of them in the periphery. So it did not seem to be a major problem. In the hotel I was staying, which I name here Hotel Moscow, but in reality, there is a hotel, just like the one I describe in the book, that's called Hotel Sputnik. Which nobody should stay at. I read this. <laughs> <laughs> By the time when the book was just about getting uh, in the process with the Harper Collins, my publisher, I did a poll on uh, Facebook. I, I asked people, who knows what's Sputnik? Well, you have to be of a certain generation, <laughs> a certain age, to remember the first landing on the moon by 
the Russian, they had tremendous amount of pride. But it turns out it was too confusing, so we just changed it to Moscow, which is as simple as could be. In the book, your, your main character, Brooke Fielding, actually has to make her way out of Russia. She has to escape. What part of that what was true for you? I must say that of all my novels, this is the one novel that borrows from my life or my life experiences. Mm. All three others had nothing to do with even personal experiences. But the scene at the hotel, there is a scene of the hotel when the militia breaks out as she's playing Scrabble with a tin Kalachnikov kind of surrounding her. That was me. Mm. And that's when I escaped, and therefore the militia decided that I must have had a good reason to flee. They didn't think that 18 Kalachnikov facing me was a good enough reason. I know my Kalachnikovs. I used to be in the Israeli army. So I know how they can you know, shoot off without particular reason. So 18 of them was not a good reason for me to continue to play Scrabble. <laughs> But nevertheless, I marked myself, and that uh, appears in the novel. My story was different from hers, because after all, I just used that experience to write an, a novel. But I was, uh, the next day, I was on a run from the militia. My, I, I w managed to call my husband, who called our congressman, Gary Ackerman, at the time, Long Island, Brooklyn, those who know him. And he put the State Department on alert, but the American embassy was closed at the time because it was just two blocks away from the Russian parliament. And they were all hiding in the basement without a change of underwear. <laughs> so there was nobody to help me until the uprising was finally, finally ended. And I, I arrived in the, at the embassy. They put me up in an American hotel for the night and put me on the first flight in the morning, which happened to be to Frankfurt. But as long as they could as long get as me you were out. out. Yes. So that's my, that's my part of my little story. And I wrote a report. This is pre-internet. I wrote a 23 report to the, Ameri to the USIA, US Information Agency, as to why I came back early. And that report turned out to be the very beginning of my writing career, which well, I didn't I, we're, know. We're thankful for that. <laughs> the, Talia, the era of post-communist Russia is so interesting, and your writing is very vivid and, and detailed. I'm really glad I did not have that experience. And there was one thing, there were a couple of things, but one that I, that I wrote down. Early in the book, one of the Russian women tells Brooke, our people are unused to dreaming. And I thought, what a cold sentence. Yes. The, when the, the, it's hard for us to grasp what it means not to have freedom. Freedom is something we, we have to take for granted day to day, every time when you and I are speaking. Every thought, every hope, now, you're in control of nothing. You live in a communal apartment that somebody decided that you are going to share because they want to change your perception of whom you are, who you are. They had an idea of the Soviet person that had no personal needs, no wants. And now they put them together, prisoners to life in those communal apartments. Millions and millions and millions of Russians lived like that. And that was an upgrade from the barracks where before then, after the Bolsheviks, they were separated men and women to live in different barracks. But so the communal apartment they created, I would say this is a room the size of this stage for a family of four. This is it. And I saw it. It is hard to imagine this is how you live a, a lifetime. But the presence of everybody in the communal apartment, for example, was that P 
people ended up not sharing, but rather dividing. And they divided every square centimeter, every square inch. You have a label on this side of the table in the kitchen is yours and nobody's to put anything on it and so on. It's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard for Americans to yes. imagine, especially. Now back to freedom. When you have nothing that's yours, not even your thoughts, every moment, everything you buy, let's say you live in a communal apartment, somebody's going to report, say you're un-Soviet, that remained, remained in the psychic of Russians until today. This is 20 years later, after the fall of communism, this is still there. You know, when uh, God took the sons of Israel out of Egypt, he took them through the desert for 40 years. Mm. And what was the reason? He said he wanted, that, he wanted the generation that knew slavery to die before they were ready to go into the promised land and live a life of freedom. I think that this is also true in what, what's happening in the Soviet Union. I, I'm not even going to today's politics. The kind of president they have who uses the KGB in a different name, but that's the kind of mentality they still have. The sense of freedom is not there. It's very hard to imagine. So yes, back to your question. <laughs> they, to dream is to want something. To want something is to feel the deprivation of never being able to get it. You give good historical perspective about what happened after the fall of communism, especially when it comes to women, because they lost their social safety net and, and they were really much hung out to dry. And again, you, you said that what one of the characters says that Russian women are not life happy. Yes. Life happy is something I didn't even know about until it came up with, in one of my interviews with I, my interviews. All my research was done back in 1993, 94. It was very fresh with then newcomers from Russia who came to the United States and to Israel. So I interviewed quite a few people. It's just waking up in the morning and feel good. That's being life happy. Something we expect to do. Yeah, just you feel good. You know, I, I open the door, you know, and I see this, the ocean here in the Florida, instead of seeing mounds of snow in New York, I'm life happy. <laughs> <laughs> An another layer in the book, your character happens to be the daughter of Jewish Holocaust survivors. Now, I, this is not a Holocaust book. Um, that is just one of the, the, the facets in here. But it explores something that I, I don't know of other people who are writing about it, perhaps they are, of what it means to be second generation. Do you want to touch on that for me? Yes. I myself, I'm 10th generation Israeli, so I did not, and I'm Ashkenazi, but my family in Israel did not suffer directly the Holocaust. But I grew up in, in the generation after the Holocaust, and every one of my friends was a single child of parents who had lost the previous family. All their parents were at least a decade older, older than my own parents. They spoke different languages at home, not Hebrew. And I. I knew their lives. I was there. I we had sleepover. We, we, we are still friends, by the way. I have a lot of them today, but still my friends. I knew what it was. It was the Holocaust was always in the air, in the photographs that you could see on, on the buffet, the table there, or in the air, in the sadness, in the fact that these children born after their families had lost the previous families had to replace a whole host of dead people. And like my protagonist, they were never themselves. They always stood for other people. I've, 
I've talked over the years with many Holocaust, children of Holocaust survivors. They grew up in freedom. They grew up with having all world goods and materials, and the parents tried very hard to do things for them. There are some common denominators. One is that the Holocaust follows them like the air of bubble in which they walk in around. I have a friend here right now sitting in the audience. I don't want to point her out, but she's one of them. They feel that all the time, but also it is a motivator. They have to be good. They, they cannot change the past of what happened, but they can do something for the future. So there's a lot of expectation put From themselves, them. but they internalize it and they want to do good. They also cannot fight with their parents. When I had a fight with my mother about curfew, she would fight with me. A mother a daughter, in, in a novel says to her, look, I stood up to a Nazi guard. I can stand up to your whining. <laughs> The, everything, I mean, you can't complain about pimples to parents who survived the Holocaust. So the life of children growing up in house, households like this are very different. Again, this is not a book about the Holocaust. It's a book about what she did as she tried to get away from it and the mistakes she had made because she had to to work so hard to get away from it that she made mistakes. And I'm not giving you the twists of the novel. No, you're not. But they are going to come to haunt her, no less, in Moscow. I, I, after I, I read this, I did just a little bit of research and realized that there are actually studies going on now for third generation Correct. Sur survivors. So Correct. It, it, it is pervasive. The other thing is the mother and daughter relationship. And you can pick up, I don't know, nine out of 10 books, there is a mother daughter, but this is very interesting. And at the same time, Brooke is battling in herself with her, her Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. You had yeah. a lot of things that you really had to get right. Yes, motherhood or the lack of interest in it or when it works and when it doesn't work is a theme that goes in all four novels that I wrote. Mm -hmm. I never assume that life is wonderful, but rather in this particular case, Brooke has a strained relationship with her mother because her, her, mother, her mother took the Holocaust so far with the survivor guilt that she could, could have no joy so we are going to get into that when <laughs> you yeah. read the book. But she was closer to her father. Those things happen in, in life. But the theme of motherhood goes through this novel, Mother Russia. The, that's how Russians refer yes. to their country as Mother Russia. One of the, protagon, of, uh, of the protagonists, side, side characters, the Russian characters, both of them, uh, work to make Russia a better place for her granddaughter, and the other one is for fighting for her daughter's well, well-being. So you would see that constantly in my books, whether in a big way or in a small way, m question of motherhood. In Jerusalem Maiden, motherhood was taken the other way. Motherhood was not something she wanted. It held her back she would have been much better off, so she believed, had she not had children, if she could have pursued her art. So, uh, again, I explore motherhood from but different it, ways. But it, it is that thread that goes through all of your books. I, I called you an activist in the introduction. You are very involved in human rights, particularly women's rights, children's rights. Many people walk through life being aware that there is this plight. Very few people do anything. Are people that are activists just wired differently? Uh, first, let me uh, put a disclaimer. Most of my activism is through the writing about it rather than being out there. I'm not a committee But isn't that as a an author person. what you want? 
what I want is to... to that that well, you're... It depends on the issue. If there is an issue that I can do something about, Puppet Child, which is a story about a mother fighting to save her daughter from molestation by the father, and the legal system fails her, I was able to do something about it. I launched the Protective Parent Reform Act, which still were passed in four states, it's in front of the legislature and about 20 others. But this was an, a case for me to do something. With China Doll, infanticide, other than this wonderful opportunity to speak at the UN, which was huge, nothing ever happened to it because I'm a single, I'm an only per, one person. I came with the, all the statistics within three minutes on my, on my desk, found out, and I could document the 1.7 million girls disappear every year. Since then, now it's now 1.85 million girls disappear every year documented in China, yet World Health Organization does nothing about it, Human Rights Watch Asia does nothing about it, State Department has the Oversight Committee on, uh, sorry, the Congressional Oversight Committee on, uh, on the Human Rights in China, they do nothing. So my activism has been very frustrated because other than I'm banned from going to China, I'm not allowed. Are you banned from I'm going banned. to China? I'm banned, yeah, my uh, <laughs> claim to fame. And this is why I'm trying not to get ba banned from going to <laughs> Russia. <laughs> but that took, t that took place decades ago, so probably Yes, yeah, so I'm not remember. talking about, okay. I'm not <laughs> talking or writing about Russia today, I refer to the past. While in China, I take it as a present day situation. And when it comes to Jerusalem Maiden, it took a place 100 years ago, and so I'm cleared <laughs> with that. But no, back to activism. When I can do something, I do something, but I find it's very hard. What I'd like to see my readers and my audiences do is write to your television stations, to your, radio, to your uh, newspapers, and talk about the subjects that you want them covered. And by doing that, this is one way of making sure that the media pays attention. I couldn't get that to happen in regards to China. Not enough coverage uh, about killing of children. The subject of, uh, the, of puppet child, the uh, justice system, it's horrible what's going on. And, uh, and just, you're talking about the American justice system. I'm, I'm talking yes. about the U.S. justice mm -hmm. system when it comes to mothers who are trying to protect the daughters, the, sorry, children from molestation. But 95% of molestation of children is by men towards girls. So that's the situation. Uh, being a court watch is one way of doing it, is just sit there and look at the judge in the eyes when he says to, that he, to a child, you have to go with this convicted pedophile because he's your dad. So that's happening all the time. And being in court, forcing the judges to look us in the eyes is one way of doing that. Before we leave, I have to ask, you had a very successful marketing consulting firm for a Fortune 500 companies. How many people thought you were crazy when you gave that up to become a novelist? Oh, no one. My husband was very happy. <laughs> of course, I you was, could write from home. <laughs> I, yeah, well, until then, I was traveling every week. I was all over the place, and I, you know, I think he never would admit it, but being by, it started to write was maybe the equivalent for him of being uh, barefoot and pregnant. <laughs> now I would stay home. <laughs> but of course, that's not what happened. I started traveling around to study how to write and do my research and, and follow my protagonist to wherever she decided to go. Those who read Jerusalem Maiden know that Esther ran off to Paris and I had to had to follow do the research her. in Paris. Oh, yes, I had okay. to follow her. Of course. And then my yeah. husband and poor husband had to follow me. But yes, but that's what I, uh, uh, I did. Well, I know there is more strife and more plight for, for women around the world. So I'm sure you're working on another book. You don't have to tell me exactly what it is, but I, I'm sure there is one coming. I have 100 pages of another book. Okay. What's interesting is the story of, about any book is we try to get the cat on the tree and then we try to get the cat off the tree. That is basically the plot, right? 
something happens. Well, I got the cat on the tree, and for two years, she's sitting on top. I cannot get her down. I don't know yet where the book is going. That cat's going to be hungry. <laughs> well, it's okay. I, I so enjoyed Hotel Moscow. I so enjoyed Jerusalem Maiden, which I will say has been a book club favorite for mm -hmm. since it has been in yeah. print. That's several Man. years. So to your credit, that, that is quite remarkable yeah. that, that it continues and continues. They are not at all the same. I, I do think I said I don't know how both of them came out of you because they are so totally different. There is that that's that simple theme of women, children, and their struggle. And, and struggle goes through all of your books. The book is Hotel Moscow by Talia Karner. It has been such a pleasure and a delight to have you as a guest today. I'm Ann Bocock. Until next time, you've been watching Between the Covers. Thank you.